Welcome to Confessions of a Parent Coach. I'm parent coach, mother of four, and your host, Ann Kaplan. This is the podcast where you will learn that even for parenting experts like me, there is no such thing as a perfect parent, and that fabulous behavior and amazing relationships are right on the other side of that realization. If you're working your butt off to do right by your kid, honor yourself, and go beyond the BS around you, you are my person, and this podcast is for you. Full disclosure, I'm a sometimes potty talker, and we deal with the challenge of raising kids here. This podcast is for grownups, so stick your earbuds in and let's do this. Hello again. Hello, hello. This is Ann Kaplan, and I'm so excited to welcome you into episode two of Confessions of a Parent Coach. And just like always, I'm going to start my episode with a confession from me. And my confession today is that, and it might surprise you as a parenting expert and a mother of four kids, and I've been doing this for a really long time. My oldest kiddo is 18 years old, but nevertheless, I say the wrong thing all the time to my kids. So I think that probably might actually be a little bit of a surprise to some of my clients because I am constantly giving them suggestions on what they could say. And when I illustrate something or teach a new parenting concept, I'm always giving examples and I'm always like kind of parroting what the kid's going to say, what the mom's going to (laughs) say. I do it all the time. But when it's me, hmm, I don't really follow the script that I'm giving my clients all the time. And I'm going to give you an example of that. So my kiddo Sky, he is eight years old. He's my youngest kiddo. He is in third grade third grade, start getting homework at a lot of schools. And that is also the case with Sky. But you know what? This isn't just a specific to homework. He really likes to just kind of take his sweet time in terms of when he's going to do his responsibilities, whether it's emptying the dishwasher, which is his job, or taking out the compost. That's another one of his jobs or all the things that he needs to do before he can get screen time, um, practicing his piano, doing his homework, whatever. He really likes to just wait until the last minute. And I know what I'm supposed to do as a mom is to hold a, hold a line and just wait for him to comply. Right. So, Hey, you're welcome to have screen time. As soon as everything on your checklist is done, I'm sure you'll do it when you're ready and just step, sit back and let the magic happen. That's what we're supposed to do. Right. But Sometimes he really gets under my skin when he just is dragging his feet. It's been like hours and he still hasn't done it and stuff like that, which is, you know, he's not doing anything wrong. I didn't give him a deadline. Right. But it still is really starting to bug me. And the other day I found myself totally losing it with him. And I was just like, he was complaining that he wanted to, I don't remember what it was probably watch TV, but it might've also been reading. We're reading, um, we're reading super fudge right now. He really wants to read but he had to take care of his responsibilities first. And he's like laying on the floor, rolling around, crying about how he can't read super fudge. And he just wants to read and all of this stuff. And instead of just letting him work through his emotions and come to the realization that he needed to do what he needed to do. Instead, I just lost it and was like, if you would have just done it when I first brought this up to you, we would have been reading already hours ago. You are taking so much time to just do this thing that could have happened like in 10 minutes, just do it. I did lose my temper. I did raise my voice and I did not do anything effective in that situation because when he's already lying on the floor, crying and whining and dysregulated about the fact that he can't read super fudge, me also being dysregulated and yelling is not going to help the situation. And guess what? It did not. So Today, I want to share with you some of my favorite things to say to kids, because even though I don't always say the right thing, I do often say the right thing, and it's really, really helpful. So I'm not going to say, oh, these are the top three things to say to kids, or these are the three things that if you say this, you don't need to learn anything else. It's nothing like that. This is not a clickbaity, nonsensey podcast. These are just a couple of my favorite things to say to kids that I think when I suggest them to my clients, I can kind of see a light bulb go off because they are so like, oh yes, of course, but we don't think of it in the moment. And before I tell you what these things are, I want to say 
that rem I want to kind of remind you that the principles that we're working on here are, you know, building autonomy in our kids, building self-esteem and confidence and independence in them, right? And that also the way that we do that is just like what I said before when I was talking about what I should have done with Sky, which is we set a boundary, we show confidence in our kids, and we let the chips fall where they may. If your kid crosses the boundary, there's a consequence. And if they comply with the boundary, that's great. And now you've created this really awesome, safe, healthy container inside of which your kid gets to make their own decisions and see what happens with those decisions, right? So some of the things I really love to do with my kids is once I set a boundary with them, to say something that indicates to them that, you know, they're the boss. I'm not trying to force them or anything like that. So the first thing I'm going to tell you, that's one of my favorite things to say to kids is, I'm sure you'll choose whatever's right for you. I love saying this to kids. And the reason why is it can come off sometimes when we're setting boundaries with kids, like we're trying to get them to pick one thing or the other. You know what? You can either wear your coat or carry your coat. Well, obviously, of course, we wish our kids would wear our coat. It's I don't know about where you are, listener, but where I am right now it is the last day in January in 2023, and it is freezing outside. I want my kids to wear a coat, right? So sometimes we give choices and we really sort of have an agenda or our kids at least think that we have an agenda. It's really nice to be able to say something that reminds them and puts that responsibility back on them. We hand the problem back to our kiddo and with confidence, I'm sure you're going to pick whatever's right for you. So, you know, Sky screaming on the floor, right? With his tantrum about not getting to read a book, you, I could easily have said to him, you know what, buddy, you can either do your job now, you can do it later, whatever you choose. I'm sure you'll pick whatever's right for you. We can read the story now, as soon as you're done with your job, maybe we won't even get to read the story today. No problem. You'll pick what's right for you. That little reminder, it's not just for our kids, this little sneaky, you know, whatever, peek behind the curtain. It's for us too. It's a real check to say, oh yeah, right. I'm actually don't know what's right for my kid. I am actually not the decider here and I'm not supposed to be. And it's real easy to forget that. Am I right? Here I am talking this stuff and preaching this gospel all day long. And even for me, I can easily forget um, what the fundamentals are that are underlying all this stuff. <clears throat> Okay, second thing, the next thing, one of my favorite things to say to kids is, I wonder how that's gonna work out. Now, I really like bringing this up for two reasons. First of all, it is one of my favorite things to say to my kiddo, but also this is a really great way to talk about the snark, okay? And I am the snarkiest of all snarks, so you can't out snark me, but we really need to check our cynicism and our snarkiness when we're disciplining our kids. And if your kiddo is just say, saying, oh, I get to wear my coat or carry my coat. Well, guess what? I'm going to carry it and I'm going to drag it on the ground behind me. So how do you like that, mom? Right. It'd be real easy to say, I wonder how that's going to work out for you. But say it in the snark, right? Because we know exactly what's going to happen. The kid's going to be cold because he's not wearing his coat. And also the coat's going to get all dirty and probably wet and slushy. So it's not really going to work as a coat anymore. It's going to make a huge mess. And if you're running your house the way I am, you also know that when your kid makes his coat really dirty, he's going to have to do the laundry and wash his coat, which is making more work for him, right? So it would be really easy in that situation where you'd be like, hmm, I wonder how that's going to work out for you. That is not what I want to say. And that is not what I want you to say. And that is not what I mean when I say that this is one of my favorite things to say to kids. So really make sure that you're super neutral when you say this, but to say something like, I wonder how that's going to go, or I wonder how that will work out, or how do you suppose that will work? If you're genuinely coming to it with neutral curiosity can be a very helpful question because it inspires your child to actually think through what they're going to do. A great idea or a great example of this is um, one of my older kiddos was uh, struggling with a bully in school. And, you know, I'm trying to use all my open-ended empowering questions with, with her, you know, well, what do you suppose you're going to do about that? Or, you know, I'm really sorry that happened to you. What's your plan? How can I support you? All those kinds of questions. And her conclusion was, I'm just going to push her back next time. I'm just going to push her and, you know, 
that's it. We'll have a fight. And I was able to check my snark and say neutrally, like, well, how do you suppose that'll work out? And she thought for a little bit and she's like, well, probably we'll both get into trouble. I'm like, yeah, that might happen. What do you think? And she was like, well, maybe there's something else I can do. You know, it doesn't mean that she's always going to make the best choice. That's not the point. The point is to really be this kind of agent for introspection and curiosity for your kids to explore themselves and think about things, right? So if you're able to be, and you have to be really onto yourself here, but if you're able to really be neutral and not be sarcastic about it, this can be a really great question to inspire a good conversation. I wonder how that's going to go, right? Just think about it and be honest. If you cannot say it neutrally, then don't say it at all. That should be a t-shirt, actually. <laughs> if you can't say it neutrally, then don't say it at all. Um, okay. Next thing, my next favorite thing to say to kids, <clears throat> and you notice how all of these things are about inspiring them to think further, to really own their own stuff, to really recognize that they're being, um, you know, the agent for change and the leader in their lives. Okay. So this one is another one that I love to say, you know, yourself better than anyone else does. I say that to my kids all the time about everything you can possibly think of picky eating. I don't want to eat this. Okay, great. You never have to eat something you don't want to. You know yourself better than anyone else. You know if you're hungry more than I do, right? Same thing with oh, my oldest kiddo. No, not my oldest. Second oldest. We have had a very long journey with him to getting him to have a job. He has finally gotten a job. And I can't tell you how many times along the way where he was telling me, like, I don't want to work in food service anymore. I'm not going to do this. That's a terrible job. I'm going to hate it. Whatever. How many times I just said, well, you know what? You know but yourself better than anyone else. I could sit here and say that you should totally work in food service, but you know yourself better. And if you know that's not going to work for you, then good for you. Good job listening to yourself. So you can hear all the way um, through all those things that I'm talking about. There's all these little messages, right? About like, you know yourself, like so many kids go through their entire life, never hearing from any adult that they actually know what's right for them. That how often do kids hear that? It's important for them to hear it from a trusted adult, even better if that trusted adult is their parent. That is the cornerstone of creating an amazing relationship between you and your child. One that's not characterized by codependency or <clears throat> dominance, but instead actual true attunement between you and your kiddo. So you know yourself better than anyone else. You can see how woven in all of these three things, I'm sure you'll pick what's right for you. How do you think that will end up? You know yourself better than anyone else. What is happening here? I am not putting myself as the boss in this dynamic with my kiddo. And I can tell you right now, it makes a big difference. It makes a, not just a big difference to our, our kids. It makes a big difference to us. So some of this stuff that we're talking about, it's like fake it till you make it. Like I actually still kind of do think I'm in charge of my kid, maybe. Or I actually don't feel neutral about this. Or... You know, I actually don't think my kid knows himself better than I do. That's okay. Because when you're starting to use some of these verbal cues, you're not just cueing your kid, you're cueing yourself. And over time, you start to actually walk your talk. And you actually believe, like, I actually believe that I don't know what's right for my children. They know better than I do. And if neither of us know, that's not a problem. I trust that the course of time in my child's life will unfold and reveal itself to me. That is a feeling and a belief that I have cultivated in myself. And some of the ways that we cultivate that belief is by this verbal cues, this fake it till you make it kind of stuff. So I hope that's helpful for you all today. And like always, I'm going to finish up with a question from one of you. So I have a question today that came from a mama in my coaching group. And she said, what is an appropriate consequence for a six-year-old not putting dirty clothes in the hamper, but on the floor instead? And I hope that sometimes when these questions are asked, you are there listening to me on your podcast delivering device, whatever it is, and answering out loud, yelling at your, <laughs> yelling at your phone, like, I know. 
here's the thing about consequences. <clears throat> I am going to tell you what the consequence I would use for this situation is, but I also want to say it doesn't have to always be exactly what you think. It doesn't have to be by the book. You know best, just like we're saying, you know yourself better than anyone else. Well, guess what, listener? You know yourself better than anyone else and you know your kid. So you have to come up with a consequence that fits your family, fits your values, fits your kids, is age appropriate, all of that stuff. So anytime when I offer hypothetical consequences or discipline strategies, you might take the principles of that and tweak it to whatever works for you, right? So the hallmarks of a good consequence are threefold. One, they make sense with the misbehavior. So we're not punishing our kids, we're consequencing them. This is the logical outcome of the choice our child has made. So it has to make sense. Second, it has to fit with what feels right to you. Because if you feel like it's against your values or you feel icky about it, you're not going to use it. Or if you do, you're going to have a lot of emotional intensity around it. So it's not going to be effective. And the third thing is it has to matter to your kiddo. So if your kiddo doesn't care about reading, taking away their books probably isn't going to be a very effective consequence. They don't care. So with that in mind, I would suggest for a six-year-old not picking up their clothes, that their clothes don't aren't in rotation anymore. So the way we would say that in a really positive way would be feel free to keep all the clothes that you take care of, or I'm happy to wash the clothes that are in the hamper, or I'll know that you care about your clothes when you've put them in the hamper when they're dirty. All of those things are great ways to set that boundary. And then once that boundary gets crossed, meaning the clothes aren't being taken care of, that's a problem. You just pick up the clothes. You could even wait until kiddos in school. It does not have to be this big, like, you know, crescendo of intensity of like, oh, you didn't pick up your clothes. Well, guess what? Now I'm taking them all while kiddos standing there crying and screaming it does not have to be like that. Just calmly pick up all those clothes and they kind of go into like clothes purgatory <laughs> is what I call it. Somewhere where he, where they can't reach it. And once they're ready to take care of their clothes again, they get a second chance. So um, that might look like just a hamper that you keep in your own closet or like up on a high shelf or in the garage or whatever. And, you know, after a while, you might say, oh, wow, you've done such a great job. I haven't seen any of your clothes on the floor recently. I think you might be ready for some more clothes. What do you think? Yes. Okay, great. Well, let's go get those clothes that you had to take a break from. No problem. So that is, a, in my opinion, for me, for my values, for my kiddo, for that mistake, that would be a really effective consequence. You have to ask yourself, would that consequence be effective in my family? And remember that the point of the consequence is not to make kiddos sad, is to create the um, respect of your boundary. So I know for sure if I pick up clothes in my family, I only do it once. And my kids have heard me said that, say that before, like, hey, by the end of the day, your room's going to be clean. Totally cool if you pick up that stuff. And if I pick it up, even cooler, because I know I when I pick stuff up, I only pick it up once. So that's great because I'll never have to worry about it again, right? So remember that the point of the consequence, the point of the boundary is not to force our kids to do a thing or make them learn a lesson. It's really about taking care of ourselves. And if we need to limit the number of clothes that we have to deal with in our family so that we can take care of ourselves, well, that's totally fine. So I hope that's helpful for you all. If you want to get a question into me, I would love to hear it. So go ahead and go to my website and contact me and send me a question and I will answer it on the podcast. That's annkaplanparentcoach.com. I cannot wait to hear from you again. I will talk to you all again soon. Bye. The episode is over, but there's more waiting for you. You can grab my free workbook, Getting Kids to Listen the First Time, that walks you through the fundamental principles I teach all of my clients and applies them to this very universal parenting challenge. So if you're sick of repeating yourself all day long or just want to learn more about my style, you'll definitely want to go to bit.ly slash kids who listen. And if you're ready to work with me, let's meet. Set up a free call at bit.ly slash Kaplan call, and let's create an action plan that gets you exactly where you want to go. And of course, links to all this goodness are in the show notes. Thanks for joining and I'll see you next time.